Okay, so today we are going to do a sort of detailed uh, analysis of the, the kind of systems that we were talking about. In fact, you are going to see the same examples again. Of course, you're not going to learn anything new because we have already fig figured out what we can get from there. But I want to show you a sort of detailed step-by-step -step way of figuring out whether something, there is a gauge symmetry or not, or whether you can do some other analysis or not. So the step-by-step -step procedure essentially starts the way we talked about. So again, I'm not going to bother about the general notation because the notation is very horrible looking. So I will just look at some examples. And maybe it's good to do them side by side. So this is one. Again, there's an old problem. And it's old, meaning one day old at least. Or was it two days old? I didn't remember. One day old. OK. So that was example one. And example two, I don't remember whether that was one and this was two. But anyway, it doesn't matter. Is something very similar. But we found that the results were quite different in the two cases. And of course, what we did was an explicit calculation of the solution as well. Here we are not going to go into that because these were simple problems where explicit solutions could be done. In most situations, that would be way too much work. But the basic idea here would be first, you would form what are called the zeroth order Euler equations. So this E0 vector, which essentially means you will take the, take the n Euler equations that you get, put them in a column vector. Okay. So here, of course, uh, we have P1 is x dot plus y, and p2 is 0 for this. Uh, the same actually is, of course, the case for that one as well. And now the Euler-Lagrange equations of motion here would be ddt of p1 minus del L del x, right? So minus del L del x would mean x minus y, but with a minus x plus y here. Hopefully, I've got the sign right. Yeah. And p2, of course, has no uh, well, P2 is 0, so P2 dot will be 0. There will be no acceleration term here, but there will be a velocity term from this. When you do minus del L del Y, so you get minus X dot. And that one will, of course, give you exactly the opposite sign. So, <coughs> so this we have already seen before. This is the first step. And the only perhaps difference is that I'm now deliberately calling this a zeroth order Euler vector. Okay. Why? Because we are going to get the first order, second order, and so on afterwards. And as we saw before, we would split this up into two pieces, the acceleration piece, which of course here would be simply 1, 0, 0, 0, plus another piece which we call k0. So this is my w times q double dot as a matrix. And the next term is a k0, which is of course y dot minus x plus y minus x dot plus x minus y. So the standard procedure we have already outlined the last day. So what do you do? You first identify that the Hessian here, W, is a singular matrix. And then you figure out that because it's a singular matrix, it must have zero eigenvalues. You find the corresponding eigenvectors. In this case, it's pretty simple. You have only one eigenvector. So all the notation basically was something like this. At the zeroth order of number alpha, but here I'm simply going to not write the alpha because there's going to be only one vector at this stage. So we will try to keep the notation as straightforward as possible. right? And our job would be to figure out this quantity, which at least tentatively is our first constraint. I say tentatively. First of all, why is this going to give you a constraint? In general, the Euler vector has accelerations, positions, and velocities. right? So if you have an equation which vanishes, a combination of acceleration, position, velocity which vanishes, that gives you ultimately a way of calculating the acceleration, which is a genuine equation of motion. However, when you are doing this dot product, the W0 being a null eigenvector of the capital W, this piece is simply going to go away, which means you're not going to get any acceleration term. You're only going to get a combination of velocity and position, which is set to equal to 0 now. 
It has to be zero because after all, zero meaning it has to be zero on the so-called on shell. Basically, once you apply the equations of motion, each component of E has to be zero. So this one has to be zero. What's special about this is this is now a combination of only position and velocity. In particular, of course, although I'm saying w0 dot e0, what you really do is w0 dot k0. This part will vanish anyway. So you get minus x dot plus x minus y. This is your first genuine constraint. The co this is not the constraint. The constraint, of course, is this is 0. And borrowing this language from particle phases, we call this on shell, although this really means if you use the equations of motion, this has to vanish. So that also means that the initial conditions that you give for x and y cannot be arbitrary. You have to give the initial conditions such that y0 has to match x0 minus x0. Okay. But that's your 0th level. To get to the next level, what you note is that this constraint has to be obeyed at all times. Right? So what that, that means is not only is this thing equal to 0, its time derivative also has to be equal to 0. Right? The constraint holds not only at a, at a given instant, it has to keep on holding. So persistence of this constraint would actually tell you that you must have this quantity equal to 0 as well, which is, of course, minus x double dot plus x dot minus y dot. So what we do is this is, again, something which is an acceleration and velocities, basically. You append this to your bu bunch of equations which has to be obeyed. On shell, you already know this has to be 0, this has to be 0, right? Now you also know this has to be 0. So you append that to the whole set. And now you get what is called the elect Euler vector at the first order. So that was a 0 at the order 1. The first order Euler vector is simply going to be whatever you already had. So I'm just writing that again, although I could just say that these two lines will be identical, plus x minus y. And below this, we will append this new equation, minus x double dot plus x dot minus y. So that's the basic procedure. You start from the 0th level. Hmm? Y dot, right, of course. Thank you. This is x dot. This is y dot, right? So you start at the 0th level. You find out whatever constraints your 0th level gives you. You insist of if you had more than one constraint, then you could have also to check whether these constraints are really independent. In this case, you had only one, so there was nothing to check. Of course, it could have been just by chance if the problem had been such that here you did not have anything. You just had the acceleration, no position or velocity. So it was just 0. Then this constraint would have turned out to be 0 equals 0 identical. That's really not a constraint. But in this case, of course, you have a genuine constraint at the 0th level. You also get another constraint from, by demanding that the constraint has to persist all throughout. So at least now you have one more equation which should also vanish. Okay? And the procedure is exactly the same. Now you have to re read this as an acceleration part, which now is the first order w now. So you now will have to have three rows. Columns are, of course, still two, because you still have two accelerations, x double dot and y double dot. So this piece will simply read as 1, 0, so only x double dot, no y double dots, 0, 0, and then, right? So this term, this piece is really this w1 times x double dot, y double dot, right? That's just the acceleration part. In addition to that, you have a k1. So we had k0 before. Now you have k1, which is essentially k0, with one more term added to it. Oops. X, no, sorry. Only x dot minus y dot. The minus x double dot has, of course, gone into the w term, right? So once again, you play the same game. You now have a larger matrix, and you now look for its null eigenvectors once again. But in this case, of course, only left eigenvectors. So you look for a row, a 1 by 3 row vector, which will vanish, which will 
give you 0, 0, 0 when you hit it with this. Okay. Now, one such null vector is guaranteed. You had 0, 1 already. You add a 0 to that, 0, 1, 0 will automatically be a new null eigenvector. But that's the thing we are not going to count because that will give, the, give us nothing new. The one thing that, will, that could give us something new is something else, right? You have another null eigenvector possible, which is, in this case, is rather obvious and easy to figure out. 1, 0, 1 will give you 0, right? 0, 1, 0 will, of course, also work. But 0, 1, 0, we don't count. Because that's already been taken care of, OK? But 1, 0, 1, note that 1, 0, 1 times this. This column is completely 0, so it doesn't matter. You just have to worry about this one. So the more systematic way would be to say, OK, let's, let's start with A, B, C. This will tell you A plus B minus C equals 0. So B could be anything. But then, sorry, A plus, sorry, not A plus B minus C. Sorry, A plus B into 0 minus C has to be 0. So A minus C has to be 0. B could be anything. And A would have to be equal to C. So it would just essentially be a linear combination of these two vectors, 0, 1, 0, which is something we are not going to count, because that's already taken care of, and this new one, 1, 0, 0. So now let's try with W1. Once again, there could have been multiple new vectors here. So the notation would have been 1 semicolon 1, 1 semicolon 2, 1 semicolon 3. It will, would look nastier. But basically, here we, are, we have a simple problem where we are getting at most one new constraint at every stage. You could end up with, say, three more new constraints at a given stage, in principle, not in this problem. Uh, or you would need much bigger W matrices to begin with, of course, for that. Now, let's calculate this. What is that going to be? It's simply going to be? Yeah. This third line. The point is the actual equation is the whole thing, right? So this has to be satisfied, this has to be satisfied, this has to be satisfied. True. So, so basically, that is exactly what is going to, will we get an independent constraint? We don't know yet. 0, 1, 0 will definitely not give you something new. You are perfectly right, actually. That's exactly what we are going to see in this case. And that actually has a very important significance. Uh, but all I'm saying is I'm not even going to look at these small details right now. I'm just going to work the whole thing out, and then everything will follow from the procedure itself. But you're right. No, yeah, getting dependent constraints means that you will actually have situations which will also hold off shell, which essentially will give you gauge symmetries. And that's exactly where the gauge symmetry will come from here. So we'll just that's exactly what will follow the moment you calculate this. W1 plus X1, what will that have, give you? You add these two, you end up with the Y dots cancelling with X dot minus X plus Y, and this has to be zero, right? But now you notice that this is not giving you a new constraint because I've already seen this before. This was w0 dot e0, basically, with a minus sign. So this is actually minus, or let's write e1 anyway, because that's exactly what it is. So at any given stage, you may run out of new eigenvectors to find, in which case you stop there anyway. Even if you get a new eigenvector, it's not guaranteed that the constraint you get at that stage is going to be a new one. It could be something you've already got. So basically, at this stage, your calculation stops. You're not getting any new constraint, because that was the only new eigenvector had, you had that give you the same old constraint back. So it doesn't this one doesn't really have any other independent constraint. But what it does have is something else, which is, which actually now, will be revealed through this. W1 dot E1 plus W0 dot E0 is now 0. That's the connection, right? Now let's see how this is going to reveal the gate structure for us. So everybody remembers what W1 was, right? It's 1, 0, 1. 
So this is basically E1 1 plus E1 3. But what is E1 1? E1 1 is E0 1, right? So I'm just dropping a step here, but this is basically E0's one element. The reason why I'm going back to E0s are basically E0s are the changes that you will get in the actual action when you vary the delta q's, right? So this gives you E0 1 plus E0 3, E1 3, but E1 3 is actually related to what? It's a derivative of phi 0, and phi 0 was E0 2. So this is DDT of E0 2. Of course, keep, you have to keep track of this. Maybe if it's a very complicated calculation, you would have to write, keep, it, keep on writing that on the side as to what terms you have. And what is this? This remember is zero, W0 was 0, 1, right? So this is just E0, 2. So what you get here is this connection, which actually is 0 everywhere. And you can easily check that. Of, of course, as was said, this is really the, th in this column, this was the third column. This was a third, third row, sorry. In K1, this was essentially the third row. This was the first row, this was, that was the second. Add, add them together, you get a zero. But what is important is, what does this tell me about a potential gauge symmetry of the system? To see that, let's just multiply the whole thing by any function of time. Okay. If it is zero, alpha t times that is also zero. But now notice that this actually tells you that E01 plus alpha t E02. And now I'm going to just play a small trick here, which is, should be obvious. Alpha t times the derivative, you can write, make that into total time derivative, minus d alpha dt. E02, right? Plus, actually, DDT of alpha t times E02. This is 0. OK, now that we are here, let me remind you what the variation of the action actually was. We worked that out. It was. E0i, right? We call that EI before, but now these are the zero edge generation E's. Plus a total time derivative term, which integrates to a fixed value as long as the variation vanishes at the ends. So this, okay, let's drop this is a zero here. But now notice that if you make delta Q1 exactly equal to alpha t, alpha t, and delta Q2 exactly equal to alpha t minus d alpha dt, what you are getting is a change in the variation, change in A for that particular transformation. And what this guarantees is that change has to be zero. So this tells us that delta Q1 equals alpha t and delta Q2 equals alpha t minus d alpha dt will definitely end up giving you a first order variation of the action which vanishes. So at least for infinitesimal alpha, this is definitely a transformation which is not going to change your action. And now what you have is a time dependent change that you can do everywhere, right? We also explicitly solved it yesterday and showed why this would come from the solution itself. But here you don't have to even have to worry about the solution. The fact that you have such a, such a thing, that delta Q1 and delta Q2 could be related in such a way that you have a time-dependent change possible, yet the action will not change at all as a result, that means you have a gauge symmetry, right? So let's just look at the contrast. The contrast in this case should make it easy to see what, what is going to be different here. Remember, yeah, go ahead. In this line where you use this triple equal to, hmm? is this satisfied off Yeah, this thing is satisfied everywhere. Because that was basically the three rows, by, uh, that was noted that if you just add the three rows, you get zero. So basically, that's a constraint which is a constraint among the components themselves. There you don't have to put in that each of the three rows are individually zero. You're just seeing the sum of the three rows of E1 actually is zero. And some of the three rows of E1 happens to be E01, E02, and DDT of E02. 
So ultimately, you just play the trick of changing the time derivative to the other one, so that you can write everything in terms of e zero ones times something plus e zero two times something. And the moment you make the change in q one equal to the coefficient of e zero one, and change in q two equal to the coefficient of e zero two, you see that for those particular changes of q one and q two, the change in action will be zero. Okay. So this is a general procedure. Where the moment you identify a constraint which holds among the e's of shell, which is how you essentially, the moment the new con constraints are no longer new, but combinations of old constraints, basically you can end up with this. Okay. Now, remember this was a, was a very slightly different example. The only change was this was a minus sign here. Okay. That plus became a minus. And as a consequence, what we saw was we could explicitly solve this, and we explicitly found a unique solution to this given an initial condition. You saw, saw that the solutions had to be AT plus B and AT plus B plus A, which means given the initial conditions, there's only one solution. Unlike this case, where given, even with the same initial condition, you could get infinitely many different solutions. So you had a gauge redundancy there. The same situation could be described by many possible solutions, whereas here, that didn't happen. Now let's see whether our procedure tells us that. Okay? So what does our procedure say about this? This one we can write down almost immediately. The only change will be the, the signs of these two terms will be different. Of course, I've, and I, I think now I should bring this back. Okay. So you had x double dot plus y dot, you still have that at that same level. But minus x plus y will become plus x minus y. That's the only thing that will change. On the second line, minus y dot will still be there, of course. Sorry, minus x dot, not minus y dot. Sorry about that. And the plus x minus y will become minus x plus y. Okay. So that's the only change that has happened in the two cases, right? So what's the w here for this? It's the same one, right? It's still 1, 0, 0, 0. So W0, the 0th order null eigenvector will again be the same one, 0, 1. And phi 0, the constraint we get will also be very similar. Of course, phi 0 will not be the same as the other phi 0 because the E0 has changed. So, but if you do W0 dotted with E0, I just going to get the second component, minus x plus y. And this is, of course, 0 on shell. Well, once again, let me remind you, on shell simply means if you obey the equations of motion, this has to happen. So this is a genuine constraint, a connection between positions and velocities. No accelerations involved. OK, so how do we proceed? We proceed by writing down E1. which is the same as, first two rows will be the same as those of E0, same thing, minus x dot minus x plus y. And the third row will come from the derivative of this one. That is, if this is to be 0 at all times, its derivative would also have to be 0. So persistence of the constraint at all times will give you minus x double dot minus x dot plus y dot. OK? Of course, now that thing no longer happens, right? Earlier, the three rows of E1 added to 0, which we could have seen immediately and then said, OK, the three rows adding to 0 means E01 plus E02 plus DGT of E02 is 0. Or even if you had failed to spot that, the idea is here, there, the problem was so simple that you could spot it just by looking at it. But once you find the constraint, it should be easy to figure out whether you have already seen that. So now, phi 1, the tentative new constraint that we will get, well, that's OK. What was, I should have written down what w1 is. But w1, again, should be exactly the same, right? The acceleration part is the same in both cases. So it's still 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0 minus 1, 0. That's a capital W. So 1, 0, 1 is still the new uh, null eigenvector. So w1 dot e1. You have to add up these two. Okay? Now when because that's because you have one zero one. 
And when you add up these two, you can forget about the accelerations. They are bound to cancel anyway. Right? Because you are dealing with a null eigenvector of the Hessian path. But even if you keep, keep them in, you, you just add them, they will cancel anyway. Right? But what do you get now? You get 2y dot. You get minus x dot plus 2y dot plus x minus y equals 0. This is not the same as the constraint that we had. It's on a multiple of the constraint that we had. So it's a new one. Right? So now this problem has two constraints, not one. The original one we directly found out from the equation of motion themselves, but the fact that the constraint has to stay true at all times did not give rise to a new constraint in the previous case. But here you have a new constraint. Now, of course, you could also notice that you don't have to write the new constraint in this form. right? You already know that x dot, for example, it has to be x minus y. So you could use that to write this as 2y dot plus 2x minus 2y is 0, or y dot plus x minus y is 0. Or you could just uh, also write this as y dot equal to x dot. All of them, they, they would all be different ways of writing down those two constraints. They will, you could choose any one of them. You don't have to choose this one. But this is a different constraint. No matter how you manipulate it, you will not get, an, get it entirely in terms of the previous one. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, the W1. Hmm. No, you don't. Yeah, the, you don't really have a freedom in the middle guy. The middle guy has to be. Middle guy, ha, if you like this independently, so this is one, right? The point is you have a, b, a. So basically, you have one zero one times a. An overall multiplier, I'm not worried about, right? Because it's going to be zero anyway. Plus b into zero, one zero. So the middle guy is basically that second term, but. This, this 0, 1, 0 will give you nothing new, because it will give you just whatever 0, 1 gave you already. This last 0, final 0 will not give you anything new, right? Not really. You don't need that. In fact, that, that, that's too much of an additional hassle to have. Here it's automatically coming out that way, so we didn't bother. Orthogonality is not necessary for the calculation. Independence is necessary. But the point is, I already knew 0, 1, 0 will be there, because 0, 1 was there for the previous step. Add a bunch, what has happened? You have just increased the size of that w by adding more rows below. So you add corresponding zeros in your small w, that will still say null eigenvector. So that will give you nothing new. So we already knew that, so we didn't bother about that one. But now, of course, this is a new constraint. So earlier, you stopped because the constraint that you had obtained was the same as the old constraint, effectively. Your job was finished. But what that gave you was a gauge, gauge, uh, ultimately a gauge symmetry. Here, of course, you can't stop here. You have to add the derivative of this as a new row. So now you'll get an E2, which will essentially be E1. This 3 by 2 matrix that you had, followed up by a new row, which will be just the derivative of this. Again, the logic is the same. If this has to be 0 not only at one time, it has to be 0 at all times. So what does it give you? It gives you minus x double dot plus 2y double dot plus x dot minus y dot. Right? OK? So here again, I can write, read off the w at this stage, the second generation w, pretty easily. Hmm. Second generation W is whatever we had before. And then what do I put in? Minus 1, 2. Now, do I put in minus 1, 2 or something else depends on which one of the possible constra second constraints I took. I could have taken that as y dot minus x dot equals 0. That's equivalent to this. And that would have given you y minus 1, 1. Okay, there are many ways of writing this. But the important point is, no matter what you do, the final convention result will still be the same. Notice that if I'm looking for the null eigenvector for this, because of the two sitting here, what will happen? The last component will have to be 0, right? which means that it's impossible to find a new, eigen, new null eigenvector. Whatever null eigenvector you will get for this matrix 
has to be one of the null eigenvectors for the previous one with zero sitting at the end. Okay. So now you have no essentially new, because you really have new eigenvectors. These are four, four, four by two matrices, so in, but no essentially new null eigenvectors. So you have run out of null eigenvectors. So this is where our procedure stops. Earlier we had no new constraints, so you had nothing, no, nothing whose derivative you could append. So stop there. Now you did find a new constraint, but the derivative of that did not give you effectively a new result because ultimately when you added that to that, you knew the null eigenvectors for the new matrix. Essentially, were exactly the same as the null eigenvectors for the old matrix as well, with just zeros added at the end, right? So it will essentially give you back the same same concept. You would just use that. What would you say? You would say one zero one zero. One zero one zero dotted with this, and one zero one dotted with the previous one right. would give you exactly the same thing. Because the only difference here is that now you have a new extra row. But that extra row will not come into the picture at all if you had a have a zero at the end, right? So basically, what has happened here is in both cases we have stopped our procedure, but in two different ways. One, because a new constraint we obtained was not really a new constraint in this case. It was actually the old constraint with a change of sign. So basically you had a connection between the constraints. That gave us a gauge symmetry. Okay. Here, what you have is not a connection between the constraints. You do have two independent constraints. And then the procedure has stopped. The constraints are not connected. So these constraints will work only on shell. If you had something like, like the kind that we had here, which works at all values, because that's an identity, right? You're just getting a sum of three things equals zero. The important thing for us is these three things add up to zero, but they're actually related directly to the Euler-Lagrange pieces, E0, 1, E0, 2, and their derivatives. So we could use that, turn it around, and consider the gauge symmetry out of that. Here, there will be no gauge symmetry. Of course, that conclusion we already know, because yesterday we explicitly solved this problem and found out that here you have a unique set of solutions for a given initial conditions. You have to have AT plus B and AD plus B plus A for X and Y. Not for this example only, but the point I'm trying to make is you don't always have to have a gauge symmetry. Gauge symmetries are very common if you have a singular Lagrangian, basically because if you carry out this procedure, at every stage you will meet new constraints and new constraints may very well become, be the same as old constraints with some combination. If you have that, then you have a gauge symmetry. If you can run out of the whole procedure without ever meeting, a, with, by, while keeping on meeting new constraints without ever getting a, getting a connection between them, then you don't have a gauge symmetry. This is more uncommon. This is actually an unusual situation. But this is not the only example where this happens. That situation is more common. You are more likely to hit constraints which are essentially the old constraints back in some form or another. So, all I wanted to illustrate is while gauge symmetries are very, very common and they can arise only in sing singular Lagrangians, right? Because if you have gauge symmetries, what you're really saying is uh, you have a solution, then you can add arbitrary functions of time, not completely arbitrary, but because even in the previous case, it was alpha t which was arbitrary, but the other one had to be alpha t minus d alpha dt, right? They were connected. But you could find infinitely many solutions for the same initial conditions. Now that, is, that would be impossible if you, if you had a non-singular W, right? Because if you had a non-singular W, your solution would give you genuine second order differential equations. Right? You could solve these Euler-Lagrange equations of motion for accelerations. You get genuine second order differential equations. And if you have initial conditions given, you would get unique solutions. Here, even with the same initial conditions, you could get infinitely many solutions. In this case, you didn't. In this case, the moment you fix the initial conditions, of course, you could not fix them independently because of the constraints. But if you fixed initial conditions which were consistent with the constraints, you would end up getting a solution, right? An unique solution. And that means there is no gauge symmetry there. So our procedure justifies that by showing that uh, the constraints that we get at every stage are basically independent ones. So uh, you mean that uh, I get the same constraints again and again? 
No, this is the same constraint. It could be, say, say the third constraint you get is a linear combination of the first two. No, but the, uh, uh, okay. So, depends on how long, okay. Uh, since, uh, so we go to till 6.30, right? So 20 minutes, I don't, I think I will do a couple more examples. Okay. No, I mean, really the problem is, look, I do something nasty. After that, Rajdeep also, I'm assuming there's something even, even more nasty. Look, it doesn't get any simpler than three by two matrices or stuff like that. And you can differentiate x dot, right, to get x double dot. So that's all we are doing. So, of course, the real point is we are choosing very simple Lagrangians because otherwise, these complicated calculations get out of hand very soon. Become very, very complicated. Nasty calculations, as you can very well imagine. So, that is precisely why I have to be careful that I remember the examples. After that, I can work out the thing properly, I hope, but if I Mis misri write the example when I don't write it down, then you are in for a lot of trouble. And I'm in for a lot of trouble, actually, but that's... Okay, I think uh, I've run out of the board here, right? Yeah, but... How big is this? Does this go all the way out? Oh, try So that, that means I actually have enough space. Good. And, so yeah. 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 And uh, thankfully, there's a 20 minutes limit on the class also. So let's not try really nasty things. Okay. This one, the next example will be a nastier example. And there, I would want you not to sleep, at least some of you, so that you can figure out whether I'm messing up my calculation. Okay, this is again an example you have seen. So this is example three, of course. Yeah, I, behave, I was behaving like a good mathematician right now. You know, mathematicians count, can't count at all. So one, two, this is three, this is okay. Let's behave like a physicist. This is again something you have seen. Well, you might say I have made this deliberately nasty because I have put an e to the q1. Why not use q1 here? The only difference is this really comes from another problem as an effective theory. The e to the q1 comes naturally. And the other thing is because it's e to the q1, you know it has to be always positive, never zero or negative. Right? So that's, a, that's really not important for the rest of this calculation. Anyway, the presence of the e to the q1 will make life a bit difficult for us, but still. p1, how much is that? Zero. There's no, there no q1 dot, right? So p1 is zero. p2, that comes from this, q2 dot minus e to the q1. Okay. So you must have noticed one thing. When I wrote QIs, I deliberately wrote all the I's upstairs. And when I'm going to write P's later, I'm going to write the P indices for P's downstairs. There's a differential geometric reason for that, but we don't really have to worry about that. But when you're doing an example, it's best to put the indices downstairs because it's, otherwise you get confused with squares and stuff like that. So Q2 dot and P3 is simpler, Q3 dot minus Q2. So let's try to be really precautious and try to write down the. Okay, first of all, the Euler Lagrange equation vector here will have three components, right? Three rows. And the first one, p1 dot is zero. You have to subtract del, del L del q1. That's sort of easy. It's, and I hope my algebra lasts that far. Yeah, I think it should. And this is. This is your first row, okay? And that obvious, equating this to zero obviously gives you a constraint, right? But no acceleration term there. It just gives a connection between the velocity and position. So the next one, Q2 double dot minus 
with the q1 q1 dot so that's p2 dot and you differentiate with respect to q1 the minus sign so plus into the q1 times okay i think i will need to enlarge the bracket here Uh, so you are differentiating with this with the square into the q1 with a minus sign. So into the q1 into q2 dot. Hmm? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm doing delta q2, right? I forgot completely. So this is much simpler. That's just this. q3 dot minus q2 with a minus sign already coming from there, and then a minus overall, so plus q3 dot minus q2. Yeah, much easier than what I did before. And the third one is. Even simpler is QC double dot minus Q2 dot equal to zero, right? Because there is no Q3 in the, Q3 is a cyclic coordinate in our standard language. So there's a del L del Q3 term. Okay, now, what's the capital W for this? What's the Hessian? You can re read off immediately, right? Just look at the acceleration terms. What's that? Zero, zero, zero on the first row. 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, right? So that's your capital W. The zero is order capital W, right? This is my zero is order capital W. And small w, the null eigenvector here is obvious. That's 1, 0, 0. In fact, we already knew that because the first, very first row actually gave us a constraint, right? After all. The formal way of doing this is you will find the null eigenvector, then dot the null eigenvector with the e. So w0 dot e0, and let's just keep track. This is really e0 is one component, e to the q1, q2 dot minus e to the q1. This has to vanish on shell, right? So that's your constraint. We already knew that the moment we wrote it down, but still, formally, this is how you get it. Okay. Now the procedure is straightforward. You have found a constraint. It has to be valid at all times. So its derivative has to be appended as a new equation. Right? Is that okay? So this is phi 0, your 0th order constraint. And d phi 0 dt. In general, this will really be a vector of constraints. Right? You could have, here you have only one null eigenvector, so you get one constraint. Right? If you had a, say three null eigenvectors, if the nullity had been three, then you would get three constraints to begin with. Of course, all three of them may not be independent. Some of them may be dependent. So if you just keep the depend independent ones, that will give a vector of, eigen of new constraints. Right? And so basically, you will be differentiating that vector, every component of that, and equating that also to 0. Here, of course, the vector sign is redundant because you have only one component. So this, let's just live with that. So it's going to be the q1, q2 double dot, plus e to the q1, q1 dot, q2 dot, minus twice e to the 2q1, q1 dot. Right? That's my additional piece. Right? Okay. Too long. So, what is? Is that okay? Yeah. Uh, zero one minus one. Will that be null? Null. Really? No. Zero one minus one. Look at the second row. Second column. You multiply zero one minus. In fact, if you start with an A B C. The second, multiplying ABC by the second column would immediately tell you that B has to be 0. Right? ABC row times 0, 0, 0, that tells you nothing. Times 0, 1, 0, that tells you B has to be 0. 0, 0, 1, that tells you C has to be 0. In fact, here it's sort of obvious the way it's written. It shows that the rank is 2, right? Two non-zero lines, and those two non-zero lines cannot be, cannot, you cannot get a 0 out of them any further by linearly combining. Rank is 2, nullity is 1. So we know that already. So here we know bef beforehand that we only get 1. We can't get more than that. Uh, but now, 
Can anybody tell me what W1 is going to be? Of course, one part of that is straightforward. That was your W0. You have to add the new acceleration terms. So what will that be? Zero? The last row, what will that be? Zero, one, zero. Zero into the Q1, zero. Into the Q1, Q2 double dot. That's the acceleration term, right? OK? So W1 here will actually, what will, it, what will the null eigenvector be? 1, 0, 0 followed by a 0 will, of course, be a null eigenvector, not something we are going to worry about. But now you notice that if you look at other possibilities, a, B, C, D will automatically force this, this will force C to be 0, right? A, we have already taken care of because that's A into 1, 0, 0, 0. That's, the, that's what we have already talked about. So the only other possibility is where B and D are non-zero, and they will actually be, this will be one possibility, right? This, of course, when you are looking at eigenvectors, any multiple will also work, but this is a simple possibility, right? So. So W1 dot E1, now this becomes, I not only W, okay, so I need minus E to the Q1 times the second row. Thankfully, the second row is up there, right? Because you need the second row of E1, but second row of E1 is also the second row of E0. And uh, we don't bother about the acceleration terms, they are going to cancel anyway, that's what this is designed to do. So you just look at minus e to the q1 into the q1, q1 dot plus q3 dot minus q2. That's, of course, minus e to the q1 times the second row. But the, you also have to add 1 times the fourth row. And the fourth row, what's that? That's just this term, right? Hmm? Plus q0. Oh, plus q0, right. Exactly. And I hope this, this one was a minus. Okay, there's a minus e to the q1. There's a, this is minus. The minus e to the q1 is just a minus e to the q1 from the w. This is a minus, then it's a plus, this is a minus, right? Exactly. So plus, and then plus this term, e to the q1. Now, this is beginning to look already way too complicated, but notice at least this term and this term are essentially the same. Of course, this is double, so it will have only one of them. You can just get rid of this term and get rid of one. Not only that, uh, sorry, this is, there's no bracket here. It is a Q1 that gives you an extra to the two Q1, okay? So you have a, uh, now, Another thing, this looks already like a pretty complicated constraint, but notice one thing. If you just look at the terms with Q1 dot, this term has gone away. Just look at the terms which have Q1 dot. This is really Q1 dot times e to the Q1, Q2 dot minus e to the Q1, right? This last term. Now, why is that a nice thing? Because we know that on the shell, this term is zero. That was our first constraint. So while I could actually live with this full constraint, but you don't need to. You can actually make life a bit easier for yourself by saying you can take the whole thing as a constraint, or you could say, OK, the new constraint is just this is equal to zero. That just makes your life a bit easier for the next step. But you do get a new constraint at this stage. You're not, not getting rid of the constraint completely. OK, now, frankly, the next step would be what? You start with this as a new constraint, differentiate that, you get one more row. OK, you get one more null eigenvector. Now I'm waving my hands simply because three minutes left, I'm pretty sure I can't do that much algebra in three minutes. So this is a homework. Work it out. The point is, OK, but I will tell you what you will get. 
you know, you already know what you will get, right? Because yesterday when we worked it out, we saw that this one has a gauge symmetry. It's a pretty obvious gauge symmetry to figure out in that case. Now, if you start with this piece, but one thing you have to keep track of, when you write this, this is basically w1 dot e1 minus q1 dot times w0 dot e0. Why do I need to keep track of that? Because basically, ultimately, when we get a gauge connection, that is when you get these constraints to be connected to each other, you track them back and write them all in terms of E0 components. Okay, that's the tricky part. If you start with this and differentiate once again, you can easily show that you are going to get a new more, one more new row with one more new null eigenvector. So it's not as if you are run out of null eigenvectors. Take that null eigenvector dot with k2. That will be your new second generation thing. This is only the first generation. You will end up with a, a new constraint, but this will not no longer be a new constraint. This will be a linear combination of whatever you have already had before. So you get a gauge symmetry. Okay, right? Because ultimately the constraints don't don't come out to be independent. They will come out to be dependent on each other. Here, it's going to be a bit more difficult to see than just by adding the three columns, but it's really not that difficult to figure out. It just takes a lot of algebra to go through the whole thing. Okay, So once you have done that, you will get some bunch of E1, E0 ones, E0 twos, E0 threes, and their derivatives, second derivatives also. Okay, But you'll remember, there's one thing which is going to come in very handy, which is this. Alpha dm beta dtm okay it was if it was first order only we could just switch that ddt from here to here at the exchange of a minus sign and at the expense of a total time derivative and this is a result which should be easy enough to prove so i'm going to leave that also as an exercise that if you have a, a something like this alpha times the mth derivative of beta that is the same as this. Plus a total time derivative. Since total time derivatives ultimately in the variation of the Lagrangian will really end up giving you no change in the action, we are not really bothered too much about that. So if you have a second derivative of say E2, let's say, times alpha, that essentially can be treated as d2 alpha dt2 times uh, e2 0, let's say. Okay. If it were third derivative, you could actually change that to minus d2. Now, this is really pretty easy to prove. But okay, any idea how you would prove such a result? That for any m, you will have this. That is alpha times the mth derivative of beta is basically up to a sign m and derivative of alpha times beta plus a total time derivative. How do you prove this? Yeah, that's possible. That's a that's a good 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 approach. And then just use the Euler expansion. That's called the Euler, right? No, or it is called the Euler formula, right? No, Leibniz formula. Sorry, that was the Leibniz formula for multiple derivatives. But showing that the Piece that you, so that will be these will be the two extreme terms of the Leibniz expansion. Yeah. That the middle terms are actually time derivatives of something. That is that can be shown, but that takes a bit of effort. A much easier trick would be to use induction. Just say that this is valid up to some m, and prove that is valid for m plus one, and it's of course valid for m equal to one. So just use induction. You can prove this, which makes life a lot easier because. At the end of the day, what will you end up with? You will essentially end up with this, that once you get, a, get this new, connect, not, not, not so new, but this apparently new constraint to be a combination of the old constraints. Remember, every time you get a new constraint, you are actually adding one more derivative to whatever old constraints you had. So you could have higher and higher order derivatives. Some bunch of derivatives of E is, or some order, order 5, order 4, order 3, order 2, Zero the order, add it together. That's equal to zero. But you multiply the whole thing by alpha again, 
And then just by using this, transfer the derivative to the alpha. And then you get e0, 1 into something, e0, 2 into something, e0, 3 into something, e0, 4 into something. So homework, complete the calculation. And you have to keep doing this until, until, you, until it finishes. Thankfully, this will finish in the next step. So basically, there are two possibilities. Either you will not get a new, new thing at, at all. With, then there's a gauge symmetry. Uh, you might not get a new, I say, uh, you might not get a new eigenvector at all. And if you have not, if all the constraints you have gotten till that stage are independent of each other, then you have no gauge symmetry. But if the new constraint you, that you get at a stage is actually a combination of the old constraints. Now, of course, it could be that you have, say, at any given stage, you may have added four constraints, out of which two are combinations of the previous ones. They will give you two different gauge symmetries, two independent gauge symmetries of the problem. But you will still get two new constraints. So the moment you have new constraints, you have to take their derivatives, keep on adding them. So the basic idea is constraints have to be obeyed at all times, so their derivatives would also have to be zero. That has to be also part of the. Uh, does the number of gauge symmetries correspond to the number of non vectors? Not really, but it's limited by the number of null vectors. The null eigenvectors that you have, you can't have more than them. So actually, that, sorry, that, is that true? Yeah, that is true. You can't have more than them, but you can definitely have less. Of course, you had the example, right? Where you had less. So having gauge symmetry is sort of the norm, but very often you may not have. Okay, so now you might of course wonder where this, uh, you have all done, have you done gauge symmetries in field theory or somewhere? So you have seen a Lie algebraic structure coming out of this. So I could have continued talking, showing you how the Lie algebraic structure of that also follows from this, it's sort of trivial. Take some effort to, some algebra to work it out. But basically, it's, it is basically the same kind of symmetry that you see also in field theory. It's essentially the same thing. Uh, but I won't have the time to do that. So tomorrow, we are going to start with the Hamiltonian description, which of course is what we are really aiming at, because once you have the Hamiltonian description done properly, you should be able to quantize the theory. Again, I'm not going to talk of quantization in this series, but the basic aim is one of the reasons why you learn this is how to quantize the singular theory. And singular theories are everywhere, sort of. Okay, so that will be tomorrow. The Hamiltonian version, and hopefully, if I get enough traction, then fifth day will be the Dirac bracket, the Dirac, and sort of an indication as to the Dirac quantization scheme.